Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? I'm ready for a road trip. Who isn't ready for a road trip after six months of being cooped up in, in your house? I would, uh, I would think anybody would be ready for a road trip, even driving through the second half of Ohio and then the first half of, Pen- of Pennsylvania and then a little bit beyond. There's nothing there, but it's still a nice little road trip. And then uh, you get rewarded by watching a football game at night in Penn State, which is always a good time. Sir, there's a little bit of West Virginia in the drive as well. (laughs) And I will thank you not to forget it. It may only be 10 minutes, but there's a Cabela's. So (laughs) I, I, I... like you're talking about the you know the uh, the road trip and like the majesty of the open road and I'm like oh man we should get a convertible and I looked at the uh, I looked at the forecast and uh, Friday when we're driving is uh, high of 48 and cloudy which is not great convertible weather especially at highway speeds but um, you know I'm just saying think about it I I have been in a convertible in uh, like late fall winter type before convertible Mustang where me and a buddy were driving his mom's car, you know, when you're in high school and you have the opportunity for a convertible, you got to take advantage of it. Even if it's like 42 degrees out, because nothing looks cooler than a couple of high school kids in a, in a convertible Mustang in overcast, you know, like I said, like 40 with the heat on, you know, because that's how you drive a convertible, you know, with the top down and the heat on and the music very, very loud. And I can tell you uh, uh, another story about that same day off the air because it was totally not appropriate for on the air. But yeah, uh, what is the weather for kickoff like? Do you know? I'm uh, terrified. Uh, last time I looked in in uh, Ohio, it's going to be 54 and partly cloudy. So and a what low does that 40, have to do a low of 41 that night. It'll be about the same. Yeah, really? it's gonna it'll be it'll be in the 40s and cloudy and. You know, maybe maybe a little bit of sun, and then uh, actually the forecast for Saturday was actually going to be dark because um, mm. it'll be uh, after sunset. So, you know, I, I guess it won't be sunny. So, <laughs> scratch scratch that earlier. It'll be uh, sometime in, something in the forties, and uh, but not rain. The Speaking only time of night games. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. The only time it's supposed to rain this week is uh, the day that we're supposed to do trick or treat in my town, and uh, that day it is a one hundred percent chance of rain and a high of forty eight. So that should be lovely. Can't wait. Um, speaking of, of night games, Tom, what, uh, what was your thought about the, the Rutgers game being a seven thirty kickoff where you just get to hang around campus until after the game and then come to the stadium so we can do a post game video. Congratulations to you. You are a fortunate soul. Mm-hmm. You, you know what time I really love to talk about Rutgers football outdoors, uh, about one thirty AM when it's probably <laughs> about 40 degrees uh, I'm going to guess it's going to rain that night, possibly totally. heavily, just based on, you know, what have you, the general bloody mindedness of the universe. Uh, so, yeah, I was I was delighted to see that as a uh, as a primetime kick, because what's better than uh, watching Rutgers football, sitting around all day, thinking about the fact that you get to go watch Rutgers football. That's the, the anticipation really just heightens the uh, the enjoyment of the whole event. You know how like you can I'll, I'll I'll be up in the stadium, and I'll be like, hey, I'll be ready in like ten minutes, and that way you know you'll get set up, and then I'm just gonna watch from above wherever you are set up out in the rain and be like, I'm like fifteen minutes out. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I just got delayed. The elevator's not working. Give me about twenty minutes, and I'll just you know be able to just see you. Like I'll be watching from I don't know, like the elevator area if you'll be out in in the right section. And, Cause that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. I'll tell you where, you know, what I think a good place to shoot to, uh, to record this would be in the, uh, the, the West, West parking lot by the river that, you know, we'll get a nice, good side shot of the stadium. And then I can just stand up there at the elevators and look down at you and be like, Oh, Tom, I need 10 more minutes. I <laughs> uh, just realized I, I misspelled a word and I'll be down as soon as I can. And then I'll see you. I, I, I will be able to see you looking up and just mouthing cuss words up at the windows. I forgot to pluralize every instance of Rutgers in my game story. It just says Ohio State beat Rutger. I, just, I don't know how I happen to do that, but I've got to fix just, those. Just give all. me an hour to write a macro so I can take care of this. So it'll be nice and easy. 
Mm -hmm. and and then we'll be good. I I think we've talked enough Rutgers during Penn State week that now, you know, we can can talk about Rutgers' great rival. And as we can be done talking about Penn State's great rival, we can can move on to Penn State itself. So today we talked to head coach Ryan Day, defensive tackle Haskell Garrett for the first time since he was shot, center Josh Myers, which was a bit of bonus coverage. We were not expecting him. And wide receiver Garrett Wilson, who had what seven for 120 some on Saturday and a touchdown. So I think it was it, it was a good a good afternoon of touching base with everybody. Brian Day, as we as I told you before the show, uh, was more open than in the past or had more to say, but that was only because there was a game to probably talk about. Of course, the, the, the I think the main thing we were wondering is about Chris Olave. And there is nothing new there from Ryan Day. If he said he can't go, they'll move some things around. His quote was, we'll see as the week goes on how it goes. So, Tom, we'll see how it goes. We were talking before the show, dude. How did we think he, how did we, how did we take Day's words? And so what did you think of Day's presentation of the possibility that Olave is out this week? He was pretty definitive after the game on Saturday that Olave would be fine and ready to go. And then he was asked today, and it was kind of like, well, you know, we can always move some stuff around. We know we'll be ready no matter what, which is kind of like, okay, so maybe he's not okay. And then Garrett Wilson was asked later, and Garrett Wilson said he had talked to Olave, and Olave was fine to go. So this is like Schrodinger's uh, cat as a wide receiver. Like, Garrett Wilson is simultaneously good to go, or sorry, uh, Chris Olave is simultaneously good to go and also not good to go. So I, I think they will do everything they can to have him ready, but I, I am not, no matter what Ryan Day said on Saturday and no matter what Chris Ola- uh, Garrett Wilson said on Tuesday, I'm not 100% sold that he is really, in fact, ready to go. I do not expect him to practice today because it's bloody Tuesday. Today's Tuesdays are, are the hardest and most physical practices. So even if he is going to play on Saturday. I don't know that there'd be any reason for him to practice today. Although if he does practice today, that's also a great sign. We will find out. Sorry, as I have a mower going past the window here, we'll find out down, you know, like I have some, somebody's like, like right out the window, man. I just like, just like old times. You want me to you want me open up the window here? It's, <laughs> it's November. Why are you mowing the lawn? Getting that one last mow in. And, and I should have, I shouldn't have turned to re- I'm recording. I have the bright neon light in the window saying, you know, there's recording going on in this studio. Please do not mow. And it's like a, a, a moth to flames, a moth to neon right there as my neighbor. Thank you for, uh, and make sure to come back and, and get the entire strip done. So um, I don't even know what we're talking about. Chris Olave, um, Garrett Wilson, uh, like, like you said, they said he, he's, Fine, totally fine. Looks wants to, wants to play, and there's no doubt that Chris Olave wants to play. It'll be up to the the medical people and whether or not he will. Ryan Day said if he can't go, they'll move some things around. Moving some things around to me means Garrett Wilson going to the Z and replacing Olave, and then Jackson Smith and Jigba getting more snaps along with that second tight end, be it Jeremy Rucker getting more snaps in that slot. I, I think there's ways to. Uh, fill that void without relying so much on Julian Fleming to step up as a starter. You can allow Olave to play outside, which he's done his entire life. This is being his first year of uh, parked right outside. Like, Hey, what y'all talking about in there? Uh, We're talking about Ohio state football. Thank you very much. Um, So that that's if they have to move things around, I guess maybe I would expect Olave, although Olave said, you know, we got young guys that can step up. It'll be a great opportunity for them. And so I don't know, he's thinking Fleming or maybe even G Scott moves over or whatever they're going to do. He seemed to be okay with somebody else doing it rather than the Garrett Wilson himself. Yeah. You reversed all of that. Yes. Yes. Well, no, I bet, I, I'm <laughs> Garrett Wilson Olave. said that about not Garrett, Chris Olave. Yes. Correct. I've yeah. got a mowing going on. <laughs> five feet away from me on purpose and i'm gonna have a feud with this neighbor and i don't know if they have a podcast if they do i'm gonna find out find out their recording schedule of course they do true go ahead tom sorry talk and i will mute my microphone so that people can have 
something to listen to that isn't um, a, a Honda. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this. I'll take us home for the last 45 minutes of the show. You just you just keep your mic on mute. That'll be fine. I, I do think that they do. Have, they have the luxury of having a pretty deep wide receiver room this year. And they have the luxury of having some good tight ends where, I mean, we saw this a lot last year when KJ Hill was not on the field. A lot of times, rather than play that second H, they just went to that two tight end look. And they have, you know, you put Luke Farrell and Jeremy Ruckert out there. Jeremy Ruckert, if you put Jeremy Ruckert in the slot, if, if a team has been preparing for Garrett Wilson in the slot, well, those are two very different people. Those are <laughs> Jeremy Ruckert has about a half of a foot on Garrett Wilson. And uh, while not as quick and shifty, you know, you you are tempted to put a slot corner or something on on Garrett Wilson if he's the uh, if he's, he's the H. A slot corner is probably not a great matchup against Jeremy Ruckert, who is going to have about a half you know a head or so of height on most slot corners. So th- that's one perfectly good option. And you know, again, who's the backup at H? Oh, it's Jackson Smith and Jigba. Um, listeners of this podcast may have heard of him once or twice uh, during the course of the year, uh, and uh, may have seen his uh, may have seen his work on the field on the. Uh, waning moments of Saturday's game. And, uh, you know, that, that's not a bad option either. I think, I think there's, a, there's a few options there for Ohio State. And you know, if, if Alave is able to go, great. If Alave is not able to go, they, they will have other, they have a couple different ways to do it. And frankly, the fact that they have a couple different ways to do it maybe puts Penn State at a little bit of a disadvantage because it's like, well, if they have Garrett Wilson in the slot and, uh, you know, or putting Julian Fleming on the outside. Well, that's that's one thing you might do. If you have Garrett Wilson outside and Jackson Smith and Jigba on the inside, well, that's a different kind of challenge. If you have Garrett Wilson on the outside and Jeremy Ruckert kind of playing that sort of slot role, well, that's a completely different thing. And that's you know, you're you're defending those in some very different ways. So that that can you can use that uncertainty to maybe you know make make things a little more difficult for Penn State in their preparation this week uh, heading into the game. I agree. Ohio State would be better off without Chris Olave on the field. <laughs> you make a, you make a valid point there, Tom. Uh, get rid of that guy. He's like Patrick Ewing with the Knicks. You know, what, when he's not there, they were better. Uh, that was um, one of the things Garrett Wilson said about Julian Fleming. He's like, I didn't realize how fast he was. You guys haven't seen it yet, but you will. You're gonna you're, you're gonna see maybe this week. The uh, the Pennsylvania native gets a chance to show everybody what he can do. I, I do think if um, if Olave can't go and Jackson Smith and Jigba is in the slot as like the number one or the one A, uh, two touchdowns. So just keep that in mind. Uh, certainly one. I mean, if he's gonna be getting that many snaps, he's gonna score at least once. Tom, that's not very bold. I mean, he's he's had one touchdown catch in every single game he's played as a Buckeye. So that's really. I mean, that's that's like oh, there will be at least one kickoff in the game. Oh, what a bold prediction. Oh wow. Oh, congratulations. Great job. All Jackson Smith and Jigba does is catch touchdowns 50% of the time. Half of his, half of his catches go for a touchdown. The other half go for no gain. Did you know that? He is an all or nothing receiver. The true definition of an all or nothing (laughs) receiver. Why don't you ask Ryan day about that on uh, when we talk to him next, you just coach, just your thoughts on Jackson Smith and Jigba being all or nothing. Can you really rely on him? Can you live with that? (laughs) Would you say he's like the Adam Dunn of wide receivers? It feels like. I think I robbed deer at receiver <laughs> here in Jackson Smith and Jigba. Uh, boy, we are slandering somebody who all we have done is just, as you say, gas up for, for months and months and months. And I guess we can because we have said so many good things that it's okay to make a little bit of fun because people know, I mean, we did it with Tate Martell, but this time it's real. <laughs> I have a feeling this story is going to end a little better than the Tate Martell one. I mean, you never know about the future, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't but, but be you know surprised. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if Jackson Smith and Jigba eventually ends up as a wide receiver in Miami. Except it would be the Dolphins <laughs> in the NFL. Yes, the, the Brian Hartline route to being a wide receiver in Miami, not the Tate Martell route. Yes, correct. Uh, so, what else can we talk about? Um, that's the show. <laughs> Noah Kane is ah, out yes. for the season. I think that's pretty significant because he was probably their number two running back now with after Journey Brown, who is also out. And now Noah Kane is out for the season. Now goes to a, another former five star in Devin Ford, but I don't know. And they've got some freshmen on the roster with him. I'm just going back to your conversation with 
with Bill Steele. He's like, well, they got this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And now two of those guys are gone. So it's, it's Devin Ford and this freshman and this maybe redshirt freshman. And so that's a big blow, especially when you consider they're going to be running the ball with a quarterback at times. And we'll get into Penn State more later in the week, but this just came out today. So it's, it's something worth talking about. Like it can't just be Sean Clifford running the ball. And it can't just be the quarterback doing it. And if it is, then you're only going to have so much success as we saw with Nebraska. Yeah, those guys rushed for like 160 yards, those two quarterbacks, but you got all of 17 points out of it. Yeah, this is this is going to be a real challenge for Penn State because their wide receiver core is pretty young. And they have, I mean, there's talent on that team. Devin Ford, I think, is going to be a pretty good running back. You've got Sean Clifford, who's, you know, I mean, he's not, Justin Fields necessarily athletically, but he he can run. He had more than 100 yards on the ground against Indiana. You've got Pat Fryer with a tight end, but the wide receiving core is real young. And, you know, I don't know if I really, from Penn State's perspective, would love a young wide receiver core against a Sean Wade and Seven Banks kind of, uh, you know, defense for Ohio State. I don't know how much they're going to be able to do through the air. And, the offensive line is better than it's been, I think. And I'm going to be, uh, I'm recording shortly after we finish recording this, I'm going to be recording with a Penn State beat writer for tomorrow morning's morning scoop. So I'll probably have some more specifics on exactly sort of the inside look at what Penn State's going to bring. But, you know, just in sort of prepping for that show, it, it seems like the line, offensive line should be better than it's been. I think Penn State really, really suffered from those NCAA sanctions in the wake of the Sandusky thing where you you lost, I I think they lost 15 scholarships, something like that. And where you tend to see that is the lines. And it takes a long time to get those offensive lines and defensive line back uh, to the level that it was before, just because those are, those are spots where you, you just, you need so much depth. You cannot have eight good, you know, eight offensive linemen or 10 offensive linemen on your roster. Like you have to have 15, 17 guys because you just guys get hurt. It's a tough position to develop talent. It's it's a tough position. You know, you you don't you're going to miss on guys in the offensive line just because that is a very very tough spot to judge talent. So when you're thin like they have been, you have one injury, one or two guys don't pan out. All of a sudden, it's like oh now the whole offensive line is just not functional. And you've seen that a lot in recent years where that's been the weak point on the Penn State team. Like they've had the skill position guys, the defense have been pretty good. But the offensive line is just like not where it needs to be. This year, they're better. Like this year, it seems like they have kind of a solid line. This is not a world-beating offensive line, but it's it's a good, solid offensive line. So they're going to have some options, but they probably need to. This is probably a game where Penn State needs to be like a plus two in the turnover margin at least to potentially have a chance to win. You know, it, it is a winnable game for Penn State, but Ohio State would need to have a very bad game defending the quarterback run and probably make some pretty pretty crucial mistakes in a couple spots to have it happen. Ryan Day was talking about the need to protect the football in this week's game, and it's something they did really well against Nebraska. And you wonder at what point do uh, d- does a running back or two put the ball on the ground, and, and do they start to suffer some of that? One of the interesting things, speaking of the offensive line and protecting the quarterback, Ryan Day was asked about how you know how did the Buckeyes do? How does Justin Fields, did he take too many sacks? And what Day said is you know, when he does take too long to get rid of the ball and he does get sacked and it's a coverage sack, you take that because there are plays that he makes doing that same thing where he waits and lets something develop and he creates with his leg. So for every sack, he said there's two or three extended plays that you know he makes. And so you're willing to have those sacks happen in general. Like if it's, I think you said, if it's like second and 18, no, you want him to get rid of the ball. But if it's like second and 11 and he just waits a little bit too long, you can, you can accept that because of what he is able to do. And so you don't, what you don't want to do, Tom, is limit him because he is an unlimited quarterback. And so you do have to give him some leeway to hold the ball as long as he does at times because They also have a lot of long developing routes, especially when you're trying to get Garrett Wilson or whomever running these drag routes 
because it's not just the slot guys who do it. It's also the out guy, outside guys who are running way across the middle, and that takes time. And so, yeah, when two of the three sacks, at least two of the three sacks, are covered sacks, and it's because he doesn't get rid of the ball, Day is okay with that, quote-unquote okay with that, because you get so much out of him from plays that are just like that, except those couple of times he just didn't get the ball off. There's nobody to throw to. Yeah, you, you have to just you have to be willing to accept that because there are going to be times when the margin between he gets sacked for a six yard loss and he breaks that tackle and then runs for 15 yards or extends the play long enough that uh, Garrett Wilson get get open downfield or whatever against Michigan last year against. Uh, yeah, a great example. And, you know, the margin for that can just be does the defensive tackle reach out and grab his foot real well or just kind of brush his foot and throw him slightly off balance and if you're if you want the pro side of that you have to be willing to kind of deal with the like sometimes the guy is going to grab his foot a little more solidly and then he's going to fall and then it's going to be second and 18 and they you know they use that as an example of when he's running around in the pocket and he's way back there you can't get yourself sacked for an eight yard loss. You cannot put us in second and 18 because when you're in a second and 18 spot, there's no, you know, there, there are no good plays. Is essentially what he said. There's, there, there's no great second and 18 play. That's going to just automatically dig you out of that. If it's, you know, if he's running and he gets tackled and it's second and 12, like that's fine. You just don't want to be way behind the stick. You can be a little behind the sticks that it's not great, but as long as it doesn't happen too much. Okay. It's fine. Don't get yourself in second and 18. And there's just, there is just a certain amount of, I think, buildup from last year when, you know, people got the idea that he was holding on the ball too long and he was, he was conservative with the ball, but if he's not going to be conservative with the ball, if he's going to be throwing the ball away, if he's going to be, you know, maybe trying to force it into guys, you know, where it's a little bit of a tighter window than maybe you would normally want, you've got to be willing to accept the potential turnovers. You know, are you willing to add, uh, you know, three, four more interceptions to his total this year if it means he's, you know, maybe not taking a couple of those sacks or that he's going to be throwing it away in third down and you're losing possession anyway or something like that. You know, are you willing to accept that? Because that's there's that balance you got to strike. And it seems like Day has has sort of where he's landed, which is try not to get it, <laughs> get the team into like that second and 18. But, you know, he, he trusts Fields to use his legs to either make plays or extend the play long enough to let other guys make plays. Against Nebraska, it almost felt like they couldn't get behind schedule. And they, even if they did, it's like, yeah, second and 18, it, that's really no big deal. Because as long as you can get to like third and 11, then, you know, Garrett Wilson is going to be open or Chris Olave is going to be open. I mean, there's, I saw one screenshot of a safety playing, I don't know, 25 yards downfield on, on Olave's side just because of the, the terror factor of what he can do. And I know Tom doesn't think he should be playing this week and they'd be better off without him. I'm thinking that he could help if, uh, if he's good to go regarding protecting fields. Uh, it was interesting what Josh Myers also had to say at the end today, how um, he would, he would prefer running back carry to every time rather than fields. Like obviously that want to throw the ball as well, but he'd rather fields not carry it at all. And the running backs always have it, and that's just his preference. But also said when he did run, when he does run, the offensive line is going to be there to pick him up because they don't want anybody messing with him on the pile. I asked him about if he saw any of that against Nebraska because there was a late shot to like the small of fields back at one point, and he didn't really get into anything that Nebraska did. But said last year they ran into that where people were messing with him in a pile. And obviously they played Clemson and we know what Clemson does in the pile. I don't know if he was referring to anything like that, um, but he also said, it's not something they've talked about as an offensive line, but they're all, they all have that mentality. Like nobody's going to touch our quarterback, uh, especially once he is down. Then uh, I'll be interested to watch that throughout the course of the season. Does it lead to anything? Are they as quick to be there as, as he says they will? I, I totally expect they would be. Uh, I think it'd just be something to watch this year to see if knowing how valuable he is, is there any funny business going on in the piles? And if so, what kind of retaliation will there be? And as a coach, yeah, you don't want penalties, 
but sometimes you you don't mind the uh, don't mess with my quarterback penalty. It, it's funny. I just was uh, saw something on Twitter, I think Monday night, where uh, I guess Andy Dalton is yes. with the Cowboys now, mm-hmm. and he got drilled, and uh, it was a, kind of a cheap shot, and there was no retaliation. And someone posted a clip of the 49ers sometimes back in the 1990s, and Steve Young was scrambling and uh, got into the end zone. And I don't remember who they were playing, but whoever it was, they were, you know, he was a step and a half into the end zone and a player from the other team just absolutely drilled them. And you saw Steve Young hop up and like wing the football at this dude from like two yards away. And Jerry Rice comes from one side to just start beating the heck out of him. And there's an offensive lineman who comes from the other side to start beating the heck out of him. And it's like, okay, you don't want to do that in the college game because you start throwing punches, then you get suspended for the next game. I mean, if you're going to do it, this would be the weekend to do it because of who's on the schedule after this weekend. But, you know, I think they generally don't want to do that. But you you want to have you want teams to know. You, you, you don't want to do this. You do not want to mess with the quarterback because we will we are going to make you absolutely pay for it. And, you know, maybe maybe that is, uh, you know, a play or two later, uh, you know, you can you can get a penalty for a blindside block. But sometimes maybe that's worth doing, like just sort of, you know, let the let the guy know that, hey. I didn't appreciate that earlier and uh, just wanted to make sure you were aware that we did not appreciate that earlier. So, you know, there's, there's a way to do it that doesn't get you suspended for the next game. Um, and, but, but I mean, that's one of those things where there is a reason the Cowboys are whatever they are, two, four, and one. And there's a reason that the 49ers in the 1990s were real, real good. And there's a sort of cohesiveness and a sort of attitude and edge that you have to play with. And this seems like, I mean, just, you think about how often we hear Ohio State offensive linemen described as nasty. This seems like the kind of group that will probably have some people who are willing to, uh, you know, maybe push the boundaries a little bit. If, uh, you know, the uh, you, you bring a knife, I bring a gun kind of thing like, uh, you know, you may have some guys who are willing to willing to do that a little bit uh, on the field this year. And if they need to protect Justin Fields that way. Yeah. And you make a good point about, you know, you can just wait till the next play to retaliate. If you want, there's it's, it's free to pancake somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you really want to take your frustrations and your your aggressions out, you're allowed to do that every single play. There are legal ways to do it. And so I I would think we'll see some of that. We talked to Haskell Garrett today, the first time that we've talked to him since his incident and try as uh, we might, there was, he wasn't interested in talking about that night. He didn't want to go into any details. Basically, just wanted to talk football, and yeah, I, I can totally respect that. And he did talk about some of the the medical stuff that he's had to deal with. He's like missing five teeth, going on a mostly liquid diet right now. Can eat some soft foods, but he's going to be on a liquid diet until he gets his new teeth. And there's like a bone graft in his mouth. He talked fine, mm-hmm. so it's like you wouldn't. I don't think you would know anything that he had gone through because certainly didn't come through in in his speech that wasn't imp- impeded at all uh, there's uh just he, he said once he found out that he was going to be okay then that's when like football started to come back into his mind and it, he like i said he didn't want to go into that night but you you got a sense of just the obviously the seriousness of it by the way he would talk about maybe like the weight being lifted off once he found out that he was going to be okay. Yeah. He, he, you know, I think step, step one was like, make sure you're, you're going to remain alive and not have uh, you know, lifelong injuries. And then it sounded like basically as soon as that, those concerns were kind of lifted, it was like, okay, now how do I get to play football again? And you know, what, as soon as, as soon as the, uh, you know, he got cleared to play football, that, that seems like that was like the best day of the process. Not, you know, not necessarily the day he got out of hospital, but the day he got cleared to play football again was like, that was like the big hurdle that he knew he had to get over to, uh, you know, to sort of be back. And, you know, this is, this is again, like we had, we had heard from Kerry Combs on Saturday about Haskell Garrett, like going into Larry Johnson's office. He, you know, he, he got shot early morning on a Sunday and uh, said he was already back at the facility on Friday, like starting to work and starting. And it's like, you know, he was, he was in the hospital for a couple of days. I don't think he got out of the hospital until like Tuesday, maybe Wednesday that week. And he's back in the facility on Friday, like, all right, let's go. And, you know, was, was not able to do the physical stuff for a long time, but he said he, he, you know, 
he could he could prepare. He could do everything he needed to do to be ready and get going and uh, to to be as mentally prepared as he could. So that as soon as he got cleared to be uh, cleared physically to be able to play, he could just kind of hit the ground run. And that's why he was out there on Saturday. I mean, this is I mean, you think about the timetable involved here. It was less than two months. He was in the hospital. He still is not eating. He said he could eat some soft foods, but it's basically just a liquid diet. It's just basically it sounds like just drinking protein smoothies all the time. And for him to be out there and be quick and be strong and not have lost a lot of ground and be ready to play so quickly, that's insane. That is nuts. Josh Myers talked about, uh, you know, the first time he went up against Garrett, it was like the first period of the first day that Garrett was uh, back out at practice. And Myers said, like, immediately, Garrett just like Garrett just beat him. Garrett just was like quick and fast and 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 strong and just went went right around him and blew up a play. And it was just like, well, OK, well, that didn't that didn't take very long. I don't know exactly when he got cleared to play. It was a, a few weeks ago, obviously. But, uh, you know, I don't remember the exact date, but it, it wasn't that, you know, this is this is like a month after you got shot in the face and you are out there even though you're just drinking smoothies like i mean you know i think people have been marveling at justin fields just eating a, a vegan diet and being able to do the stuff he's doing it's like <laughs> uncle garrett has basically not been eating solid food for two months and uh you know is anchoring the center of that ohio state defensive line at the at the three tech spot and making an immediate impact in game one like it wasn't like this you know heartwarming like rudy story where he went out there and was offsides and you know hey. made, made this meaningless play this was this was a, a defensive lineman who actually belonged on the field and was making an actual play against actual opponents and doing it within the bounds of the game. And, uh, you know, legally, that's, that's, you know, that's amazing. And I, I wrote about that on Saturday. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you should do the next, uh, the next Haskell Garrett article. It feels like we could, do, <laughs> we could do another one now that we've talked to him. But, well, yeah. And, and there will just, be one on, uh, yeah, on BuckeyeScoop.com yeah. this week at some point. But, yeah, it just, it, it's just an incredible story. And, and you just you feel really good for him that he was able to come back and, and make an impact that quickly. Myers was Myers. His quote is, I could just tell that he was so happy and excited to be back after that, that first padded practice. And he was like, I was like, oh, my God, I don't know what he all did in quarantine. <laughs> but when he came back, he was just different. And we talked about that shoot time the last last week, how everybody came back better and different. Uh, from from their individual quarantines and again i go back to what does mickey mirati do around here uh you know just uh sends people home and gets them back better i don't know um so, so you think he should uh he should just like chris Olave, uh sit sit this one out that send would him to would california for a week mm -hmm. come back better than ever that's the plan uh, so then we uh we, we did talk to josh myers and i i think Echoing maybe what Wyatt Davis and, and Ryan Day have both said that the running game, the first game is, is just, it just, it's just different. And uh, he did said that there was no really missed assignments. It's just a different speed playing different guys who are playing against different guys who are trying to do different things. And, you know, it just takes a while to get that camaraderie and everything that is required of an offensive line. And there are no concerns that they won't get there. I do uh, think that it, it's probably not going to be any easier this week because you're playing Penn state with their defensive line. So don't expect, I'm not expecting like seven yards to carry or 300 yard day. If they get over 200 yards, I think that's a pretty good day against a very good defense and, and whether or not Penn state they're, they're good enough and, and they're going to make life difficult. They were thrilled. Uh, both everybody was thrilled with Nicholas Petit Frere, who did end up grading out a champion at right tackle. Anything else from Myers, Tom, that caught your eye that you wanted to touch on? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing from him was just everyone is kind of right in the same boat there. With like, no one's concerned about it. Like mm -hmm. every Brian Day on Saturday after the game, Myers today. Uh, talked to Ross Fulton about it on the morning show on Tuesday. He said, you know, it's fine. Cause I, I mean, I walked out of that stadium without having to rewatch the game, just watching it live, just kind of going like, ah, the line was just not as dominant as I thought it would be. And then you rewatch it. And it was kind of like, okay, well that wasn't really on them. Okay. That was, you know, and then Ross, Ross had some uh, very interesting stuff on just the schematic reasons, like the specific stuff that Nebraska was doing that made 
you know, took away some of the things that Ohio State was doing. And, you know, there's some running back issues that the guys missed, missed holes and that kind of stuff. So it was probably, it was not as bad as you probably walked away from that game on Saturday thinking. So, but I mean, it was just, it, the, the talk from everyone has just been very much like, yeah, I mean, it'll be fine. We, we've got some stuff to get cleaned up, but it's like, it is exactly the stuff you hear from them after the first game every year where it's like, yeah, it wasn't perfect, but it was okay. And, you know, we got some stuff to get cleaned up and we'll get that cleaned up and it won't be a problem. And usually when you hear that, that's the case. It's not, it's not just sort of the brave face talk. It's, you know, that's, that's usually true. We also talked with Garrett Wilson. Um, he was asked about his fourth down catch because, and then I wrote about this um, on the Ask the Insiders board like Sunday, that, te- that, that catch, that ball was tipped at the line and he still had the focus to catch it. And that to me is just an indicator of just his natural feel for the game. He credits basketball a lot with that as well. Uh, somebody asked him, you know, do, you, do you practice bad tip passes and there's really no way to do that and i'm thinking tom i'm just as we're talking all you need to do is just like put like a broom or something in front of the jugs machine and then the ball is <laughs> going to come out all wonky like let it skip off of something but then i'm also thinking that might be a good way to break a bunch of fingers and and maybe that's not not such a good thing it's like maybe you don't want to practice for an oblong football coming at you in all a whole bunch of different directions you just hope that the natural way that it comes at you is enough and, and the repetitions will be enough to catch crazy tipped footballs. Maybe, maybe you don't want to practice that. I, I think that seems like a lot like how he, he described uh, Jackson Smith at Jigba's, you know, kind of circus catch. And someone asked him, you know, is that something you guys can practice? You know, do you, do you work on doing the crazy play where you're trying to lean in one direction and get your toe in just inside the line? And he said, you know, no, Ryan Day's philosophy is, you have to make the routine plays look routine and like everything else. Like you worry about that stuff later, but you make the routine plays look routine. And then, you know, so they're not working on catching it with one hand over your head and uh, toe tapping your one foot just inside the line. Like they're not doing a drill specifically for that, but just, you know, as you're getting repetitions and he talked about how much time he got with Justin Fields this summer. And just, they had so much time on the field all summer to get ready for the season. Because, you know, because it's an extended off season and quarterbacks and wide receivers could do stuff basically all summer. They, you know, there's not, they were able to prepare in a way that like the linemen couldn't. So you, you get those reps over the course of that time and just by their nature, like you're going to have times when you're trying to make that catch and you're trying to make that play, but they're not, you know, they're not specifically doing the uh, catch it with one hand and uh, you know, the other, you know, the basically like the twister thing, like, okay, left hand on football, right, right foot on the blue and, uh, you know, left foot, keep it out of bounds, you know, out, off of the out of bounds until you get the right foot down. Like they're not, they're not doing that. It's more make the routine plays look routine. And then like anything else beyond that is kind of a bonus. When I was a kid, we would like we play in the backyard or wherever and, and wherever there's a sidewalk, that's like the sideline. And we would do the Chris Carter, like fingertip, try to catch, staying in bounds and falling to the ground like he used to do. I think it's a great, uh, it's, I'm not saying I'm the Tom Omansky of football, <laughs> but kids, that's a, it's a nice little drill. Just find something to be your sideline and reach for that ball and just make sure you keep your toes down and, and make that play. Jackson Smith and Jigba is from Texas. Garrett Wilson is from Texas. We know that uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba is Garrett Wilson's backup. So I asked Garrett, did you teach him that move? Did you teach him that toe tap? And he said, no, we'll give that credit to Texas. And I thought that is a very, a very proud Texan giving an answer right there to credit a state for an ability. And I, I, I can't disagree with him 100% because he also said Texas high school football prepares you for college football. And we see that everywhere in college football that Yes, there are a lot of Texans who play Texas high school football who end up doing pretty good in college. So I, I, can, under, I can appreciate giving credit to Texas. But Tom, that play happened in Ohio. You know, it's so strange. The uh, magic of Texas high school football doesn't seem to apply to players who stay within the ba- boundaries of the state of Texas to play. So maybe this is one of these things where it's like, you know, like the, the, the stories where, you know, 
the uh, the the magic the the holy grail at the end of uh, Indiana Jones and uh, whatever the heck the third one was. I don't the remember. Last Crusade. The Last Crusade. Yes, Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. They uh, you know the grail only works up until you get to the seal. This is the opposite. You need to break the seal of the state of Texas, and then the um, the magic is unlocked. Because uh, if the magic worked in the state of Texas, uh, Tom Harmon would probably have a lot more job security than he does right now. You're exactly right. It's like Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In Texas, it's just a wardrobe. You've got to enter it to enter Narnia, where Narnia would be the rest of the country. Where Texas, it's just a closet. Once you like go past the closet, now you're now you you can become something magical and something wonderful, as opposed to a bunch of brats. You know, a bunch of British brats, just which is very uh, not unlike, I would say, uh, these Texan high school football players who are entitled. It's not until they reach out and go through the wardrobe and get exposed to real life and magic and talking animals where they start to blossom and become their true selves. And um, and maybe that's why and we saw Tom Herman trying to smash up that wardrobe. Remember when he had that big sledgehammer and he was trying to break out that locker room, trying to find the magic. And he didn't find the magic. And maybe somebody else can do it. Who knows? Probably not. If Tom Herman can't do it and Mac Brown can't do it and Charlie Strong can't do it and John Makovic can't do it. I don't think it can be done. Tom, do we need to talk any more about Texas? No, I think I think we can end that conversation with the four words that I end every Texas conversation with. Okay, cool. Hook them. Very well said, Tom. In fact, I think we're done with this show. Do you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we go? I mean, a hearty roll tide is always appropriate in any <laughs> any, case, any circumstance. But uh, other than that, no, I think we're I think we've kind of covered our covered our. Uh, stuff from from the uh, tuesday interviews we'll have more we'll have another show obviously for you guys on thursday also uh like i said i'm as soon as we're done recording this i'm going to be recording with a, a penn state beat writer for t- the uh, wednesday morning edition of the morning scoop looking forward to that I have some uh interest to get his thoughts on uh, where does penn state go from here with uh, journey brown obviously already out for the season noah kane now out for the season you know wh- wh- where does penn state go from here how do they solve the uh the problems that they're they are probably going to face in offense because you know i don't know i don't know if uh penn state you know penn state will will put some points up but uh and their defense is pretty good i don't know that anyone's holding this ohio state offense under 30 35 points this year so how does how does penn state get to 35 on on saturday in, in state college those are all very good questions that may have no answers or very poor answers and answers that need to be checked and rechecked and it's you know what these just the numbers just don't work. They're not working. They're not. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board and we will see how that goes. So we want to thank you all for listening. Make sure to check out BuckeyeScoop.com. I just saw Ross's piece got posted. I didn't get a chance to read it, but there's a bunch there. So I'm looking forward to it because it, Tom, I don't know if you're like me. I like to be smarter mm-hmm. and Ross makes people smarter. So I would recommend you guys check that out. Alex just dropped something as well. A bunch of recruiting stuff um from gosh the weekend the buckeye bash there are some rumblings of some happenings in the 2022 class which could be happening weeks days so uh if you guys are not yet members at buckeyescoop.com i would recommend it because there's going to be a bunch of stuff going on there is already a bunch of stuff going on and you can find so much of that and the discussions of it on our ask the insiders board so Check that out, become a a paying member, and I promise you, you won't regret it. And Tom, have a good one. And we'll talk to everybody later. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. I know it was a totally different ending than we normally have. I was just, you were looking off and like you were doing something. And I I just need you, I need your attention here (laughs) until we're done. Okay, cool. Welcome. Roll Tide, Chief.